Hello and welcome in the name of God, who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The Gospel that we're looking at for this 16th Sunday after Trinity is a very powerful one and speaks to some of our contemporary preoccupations about inclusion and the next exclusion. It's Matthew chapter 9, beginning at verse 38. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. And we tried to stop him because he wasn't following us. But Jesus said, Don't stop him, for no one who speaks a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterwards to speak evil of me. For whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you puts a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The great watchword today is about inclusion. Whenever you put inclusion up in social media or uh, anywhere else, people get very excited and they say, this is lovely. We, we want to draw people in. We want to draw in the, the vulnerable, the excluded, the lonely and the isolated. My own sense is this comes as a matter of psychological projection from our own fears. Part of the human condition is to feel this isolation, this the separation from God and from other people. We're very afraid of it. We're afraid of being alone. We're afraid of being on the edge. And because that's our fear, one of the ways we deal with it is by trying to make the world an antidote to our anxiety. But it's not what the gospel is doing, and it's not Christianity. There have been some arguments all the way through Christian history about who's going to be saved at the end. And of course the answer is we have no idea. <laughs> it's not up to us. A part of us longs, as, as Julian of Norwich does, when she writes, all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. And when she interrogates God in her visions about who's going to be saved, part of us is like her and says, Lord, we want, we want your love to stretch out as far as it possibly can to everyone. Don't let anyone slip through your fingers. Part of us also looks at the Gospels and we see that Jesus is very clear that at the first reading, not everyone is going to heaven. Why? Well, partly because God dignifies us with a choice. Partly because the real dynamic appears to be one of choosing between heaven and hell. One but choosing between Jesus and Satan. Look how stark Jesus is in this passage. Because at first sight, it's one of these nice inclusive passages. Whoever is not against us is for us. Well, that's wonderful. Of course, Jesus uses two phrases which appear at first sight to be contradictory. Whoever is not for us is against us. So we have to set these two things in context. Here is a great inclusive phrase. Whoever is not against us is for us. John has seen somebody expelling demons in the name of Jesus. And he's not part of the inner crowd. John wants to know whether or not, if he doesn't belong properly, he shouldn't be shut up. So, John says, we try to stop him. He's not following us. He's not getting the, the proper teaching. He doesn't really properly belong. But he was expelling demons. This is a very big thing. He was delivering people from the influence of evil as it had lodged inside their hearts and their minds. And so Jesus says to him, don't stop him. Why? Because no one who does a deed of power in my name 
will soon be able afterwards to speak evil of me. In other words, this man was doing deeds of power. So who are to be included? Well, the ones who are doing deeds of power in Jesus' name. That's not a very large number of people, but it's some and it's important. Jesus' great concern is whether or not this person would speak evil of him later. Is this somebody who would repudiate the gospel? To repudiate Jesus' claims to be the Son of God, God incarnate, come to save people. And Jesus says, hardly. He's not likely to be against us because he is exercising power in my name. And then Jesus goes on to reflect on this inclusion and exclusion thing. This is really quite interesting because another passage that's used to include everybody on the basis, for example, of, well, acts of compassion, uh, the end of Matthew 25, remember where Jesus talks about the sheep and the goats and he talks about the final judgment and people being divided in front of him and the criteria for being welcomed into the kingdom is for feeding the hungry housing the homeless, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, visiting those in prison. And Jesus calls them, these the least of my brothers. And the argument has always been, are these early Christians, in other words, are these acts of compassion defined because they're related to the gospel venture to the church? Or are they universal acts of compassion, acceptable because they're offered to anyone? Well, there's no doubt at all that universal acts of compassion are very important. We offer them gratuitously without condition on behalf of God who loves us. But there's also quite clear from this passage that it isn't just enough to be loving or compassionate or kind. Salvation is linked to our relationship with Jesus. Quite clearly, as Jesus says here, Truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink this sounds like the Matthew 25 passage, doesn't it? Because you bear the name of Christ, in other words, because you are the least of these my brethren, they'll by no means lose their reward. Now Jesus then goes on to expand on this inside or outside, inclusion or exclusion bit. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, well, this might be children, it certainly includes children, and certainly putting a stumbling block in front of any child is a matter of the utmost seriousness, for it is in a form of the most dreadful abuse of power. But it looks too as though Jesus is extending this to the vulnerable, to, to people who are small in the spirit, to people who are dependent in some kind of way. Don't, don't mess them around, says Jesus. Don't make it harder for them to believe in me and be saved or you will suffer yourself the most dreadful consequences. And then he reflects on what it is that's going to stop us getting into heaven. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed. Now that's a very interesting phrase. The other day someone was saying how irritated they were that, that their atheist brother kept on saying, well, you know, life isn't a rehearsal, you have to live it now. No, no, she said, that's exactly what it is. Life is a rehearsal. Our life now is exactly a rehearsal for eternal life. And so when Jesus says, it's better for you to enter life, he's talking about life after death. That's real life. This is a shadow of what is to come. This is a, a period of pre pre preparation, a period of, of qualification period of getting there, a period when our choices we make now define whether we have life or something awful. It's better for you to enter life than have two hands and go to hell to the unquenchable fire. What if something you have now stops you entering heaven? Get rid of it, says Jesus. Don't let it happen. What if you had two eyes but one of them cause you to be blind. Better to cut it out. Rather, one of you caused you to sin and took you away from God. Actually, that really does define many of us. One of our eyes is fixed on God the Father and the other eye wanders. Have you not seen the wandering eye effect? How we get 
attracted and distracted by things that have nothing to do with the kingdom of heaven. Pluck it out, says Jesus. I can't begin to imagine what it would be like to pluck out an eye, literally. Best to do it metaphorically. But Jesus says it's terribly important. What we're dealing with is a struggle between life and death, heaven and hell. Listen to what St Paul says in Acts chapter 6. He's telling Agrippa why he's experiencing Jesus and what Jesus has called him to do. This is what he says he heard. He heard Jesus say, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting on the road to Damascus. Get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you to serve and testify to the things in which you have seen me, and to those things in which I will appear to you. I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles. Here it is, to whom I am sending you to open their eyes, so they may turn from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God so they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place amongst those who are sanctified by faith in me. This is not the kind of inclusion that liberal Christians keep on peddling. This is not the kind of inclusion that progressives talk about as a pattern for a utopian society. Jesus divides between darkness and light, between the kingdom of heaven and between Satan, between those who don't repent and those who do. As this social idea of inclusion, an entirely false idea, apart from anything else, one of the things inclusion does is to exclude Christians who say, this is the gospel, you have to repent. This is the gospel, you can't have unlimited sexual proclivities if you want to believe in Jesus and be saved. You can't Give yourself to pride, a whole load of things you cannot give yourself to and be saved. Christians get excluded now um, if they bear witness to the gospel. So it is quite clear that Jesus is a divisive figure, that Jesus excludes from the kingdom of heaven those who choose not to repent. And as Christians, we have to beware of this inclusive rhetoric. Diversity, of course, means the extraordinary, endless creativity of God's creation. In that sense, Christians believe in diversity. We don't believe in a diversity that says you can be anything you want and do anything you want and it's absolutely okay. There are no limits. On the contrary, God is turning us into his children, into obedient children, Children like the prodigal son who comes back and say, Lord, I'm not worthy to live under your roof. Diversity, unlimited and detached from God's plans for us, is a very dangerous thing. False inclusion is just simply not true. There is no tolerance in the Gospels. Jesus did not tolerate those who told untruth. He did not tolerate those who lived values against the gospel. He did not tolerate those who refused to believe. He did not tolerate those who worked against his followers. There is a sense in which Christians have to be intolerant because we cannot tolerate evil. We cannot tolerate anti-truth. We cannot tolerate real hatred as opposed to politically correct hatred. The gospel is very much then against this present rhetoric of diversity and inclusion, undefined. Jesus warns us that we are always choosing between light and darkness, salvation and exclusion from heaven. He warns us that our acts of compassion, the one that matter to him, are ones to do with supporting the church, the body of Christ, supporting believers, supporting those who suffer for their faith in Christ. This is where he wants our primary compassion to be directed. Of course, we offer love and, and, and our goods and kindness to those who have none. Of course we do, because we want to model the incredible generosity of God. But let it always be understood. They are conditional. 
They are conditional on our having received them from God himself and our acknowledging we only have life because God has given it. Of our acknowledging we can only forgive because God's forgiven us first. Of our acknowledging Jesus because it is he who has washed our souls in the blood of the atoning lamb. All these grand words like diversity and inclusion and love are defined by the Logos, by the eternal Son of God. And Jesus warns us this is a very serious business indeed and invites us to go to any length at all to make sure that we don't find another good, another goal, another value that gets between us and acknowledging him. Cut it off. Pluck it out. Get rid of it, he says. Nothing is worth depriving yourself of life and love and forgiveness and joy in my presence. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen.